The parable that Jesus tells to his disciples, Peter being the main audience, is one that doesn't really need any explanation. The imagery is vivid, and we can easily understand the point that Jesus is trying to make in this story. It does beg the question, however, of why the first slave who was indebted so greatly, the one that was forgiven, why it is that he didn't extend that same forgiveness to those who were indebted to him. That question is what sends us back, scratching our heads, sends us back to the story, wanting to engage it again to see what it might illuminate for us in the hearing of it again. I believe that the reason that forgiven slave did not do the same for those indebted to him was because he didn't let it sink in that he had been forgiven. He didn't let it sink down in him what it is that the one he owed so much to had done for him. He didn't take the time to let it sink way down in him, the reality that he was free because of mercy. It seems that if he had, he would have seen the other guy, that one who owed him a hundred denarii. If he had remembered this and allowed it to sink in, I think he would have seen the other guy, not as one who owed him something, but as an indebted human just like him. I believe that he didn't take the time to realize the blessedness that he had received, that forgiven slave. And if he had just allowed it to sink in, he would have seen everything differently. He had been liberated, forgiven, freed. He knew bondage no more. And if he had remembered that, he would have offered that liberation to others. I know of a story of Charles Simeon, an Anglican priest, back in the turn of the 18th century into the 19th. He was the curate at Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge. And he was known for his evangelical preaching and his ability to convey the power of the gospel. A friend of mine who's read some works about him told me the following story. There was a young man, a Cambridge student, who was depressed and burdened by all of life. And someone encouraged him to go and see Father Charles. And so the young man did. Father Charles welcomed him in. They sat down together. And he pulled out, Father Charles pulled out a big bank ledger. On one side of the page is where you list your assets and on the other side of the page is where you list your debts. And so Father Charles said to this young man, list all the assets, all the things that you have done right in your life, things that you feel like made the world a better place or which you're proud of. Put all of those over here on the assets page. And the young man, somewhat begrudgingly, did. He wrote down everything he could possibly remember. It was a pretty good sized list. Then on the other side, Father Simeon said, on the debts, I want you to write down everything you've done wrong. And again, the young man wrote down everything. It too was a very good sized list. Then Father Simeon took the list and returned to the assets and said to him, I want you to cross off anything on this list that you did for ulterior motives, not just out of the kindness of your heart, but because there was some benefit to you. Mark out anything good you did that was of some benefit to you. Mark it off this list. And the, so the young man did, marked it off of his assets. Again, Father Charles said, now I want you to mark off anything that you ended up actually benefiting from. Something nice you did, maybe just because you did it, but it became beneficial to you. It gave you a boost. Cross off anything here that would be in that category. And so the young man did. And again, Father Charles looked at this list, at the few remaining items, and said, now I want you to cross off anything on this list that you did out of obligation. And the young man crossed off the remaining things on the list. Looking at this ledger, Father Charles said to the young man, what do you have now? And the man in despair said, nothing for he saw the length of his debts on the other side of the page. 
Father Simeon opened up his drawer and he pulled out a stamp, the one that says paid in full. And he took it on the side of the debts and he stamped it on there so that all of the list of debts was acknowledged as paid in full. And he said to the young man then, now what do you have? And the young man looked at Father Charles in disbelief and said, everything. When we know ourselves to be forgiven, when we know our bondage to be released, when we know the liberation that we did not deserve and yet we have been granted, we find ourselves changed forever, just as that young man had experienced. We hear this in our Exodus passage today. The portion that we read um, responsively is called the Song of Miriam. You may have noticed on your leaflet that it's in quotes. It is still from Exodus, but it is a song, and thus the reason that it's uh, written that way um, in text. Miriam, the older sister of Moses, you remember her, right? In the earliest stories of the Exodus, right at the start of Moses' story, he was that baby, you know, in the basket that was lined with tar so that he could float down the river by Pharaoh's household where his daughter, Pharaoh's daughter and her servants were bathing in hopes, Moses' mother had, that he would survive the execution of all of the Hebrew children that Pharaoh had ordered. You remember that, right? He, he floated down the river, and there was a young girl there that kept watch. It was his older sister, Miriam. She was probably 10 or 12 years old. And it was she who went to Pharaoh's daughter, who was captivated by the basket and discovered this baby within it. It was Miriam who went to Pharaoh's daughter and said, I know someone who can nurse that child for you. And so it was that Moses' mother fed him in the early years of his life. That's the Miriam we're talking about. Here they are grown up and they have now left Egypt where the Hebrew people were in bondage. Their people. And if you recall, it was hard to get gone from Egypt. Plague after plague was, come, was brought upon the Egyptians. And when you read the story, each time Pharaoh says, okay, I'll let them go. And each time he changes his mind. Every single time he does not let them go. He clamps down harder. He makes it so that they have to make bricks without straw, which is actually impossible. And so it is that God has called the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And he did so by the last plague, killing the firstborn of all of creation, but not of the Hebrews. And the Egyptians were so discombobulated by this massive death that they were distracted when the Hebrew people left. But do you notice what happens in this story? Pharaoh gets going. He promptly, as promptly as he can, gets his army together to pursue the Hebrew people. So not even then does he really let them go. He's after them. And they make it to the sea. And you see here, we, we read in the story this morning, that there's a fog that comes around and disorients the, the Egyptians that are in pursuit of the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people cross uh, the sea. And they can tell, they can hear the Egyptians coming. And they're certain that they won't survive this one either. And yet, as the Egyptian army goes into the sea, they are overcome with water. Their chariot wheels get clogged in the mud. The very riches that they had touted become their downfall. And their evil is eliminated. And so it is that Miriam sings so it is that she sings in the passage in Exodus that we read today. The horse and the rider has he hurled into the sea. We really are free now. We have been liberated. She sings this whole song and then she gathers all the women and the tambourines together and they sing it again and they sing it again and they sing it again because they need to remember what God has done for them. Everything has changed now. They are no longer bound by their enslavement in Egypt. They are a liberated people because God has liberated them. And God is the one that does the liberating. They can feel confident in this. And we know that most of the time they do. I'm struck by this part of the story of Exodus, of how pursuant evil is. Evil doesn't say, you won, good game. Evil doesn't say that. Evil takes a turn, 
finds a new way, looks for the place of weakness, and there is where it comes in. And evil is not some outside force, but that which is a mutation of good. When we forget who we are as God's children, we create things that distort our understanding of ourselves and one another. And that's what evil is, is a distortion of God's creation and of our awareness of who we are as God's people. We can pass this distortion on again and again. We can teach it to our children. And this is how evil continues from generation to generation. We are reminded, though, in this, Hebrew, this story from Exodus of the Hebrew people that the liberating goodness of God needs to be sung and declared. And as Christians, we know that in Christ, just as the young man who sat with Father Charles came to know it with the bank ledger. And once we know our liberation, there is no way to hide it. Peter Momsen is the editor of a magazine in, in, um, entitled Plow Quarterly. It's a magazine that I subscribe to. It's of the Anabaptist orientation, and I find really good theology in there. I want to share with you this most recent edition of this quarterly magazine, which is focused on solidarity. And Peter Momsen is the editor, writes this in his editorial piece, which is entitled The Solidarity of Forgiveness. I'm leaving out a big chunk of what he wrote, but I chose a few, a couple paragraphs here because I love how Peter states the significance of the cross in the Christian life. Christianity, Peter writes, Christianity with Judaism and other faiths teaches that people are first and foremost bearers of the divine image. Each of us shares with all others the fundamental bond of our common humanity. Because of this, the gospel utterly condemns the oppression of one group by another, including the entire demonic edifice of white supremacy. But for that same reason, the Bible refuses to fight fire with fire. It refuses to encourage combating group self-interest against group self-interest. No, what the Bible does, what the scriptures tell us, is that the way of the cross is no grim invitation to self-abasing struggle sessions. Instead, the way of the cross is a doorway to rediscovering the glorious calling we all share is with all human beings. By taking up our common guilt with all humanity, we come into solidarity with the one who bears it and redeems it all, Christ himself. Because we remember what the Apostle Paul says, for as in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Yes, in Christ, sins are forgiven, guilt abolished, and a new way of living together becomes possible. This solidarity in forgiveness, the solidarity that Christ has taken up with us, gives rise to a life of love. The solidarity that Christ has taken up with us, which is the solidarity of forgiveness, gives rise to a life of love. And that is why we make a confession. That is why we lament. That is why we say, I'm sorry, even when it's hard to say. Because we want a new creation of love, a new life of love, a new way of being. The competitive oppression isn't serving humanity, and we are a part of humanity, each and every one of us. This afternoon at Jazz Vespers, we will pray the anti-racism covenant, something penned by the Right Reverend Dion Johnson, who is the Bishop of Missouri, a classmate of mine, I'm happy to say. This beautiful thing that he wrote has lament confession and covenant as a part of it. And it is not a self-abasing exercise. Instead, it is a recognition that the ways that this world has been constructed for 400 years is threatening the life of us all. And we need to cry out for God because that which has been constructed, the way that good was turned into evil, has taken on a life of its own. 
We need divine help in order to defeat the evil that we have created collectively. The evil that was created just one decision at a time over centuries. The evil that we are a part of. Our gospel lesson today reminds us, Jesus is seeking to remind us as he speaks to his disciples. Notice your indebtedness. Receive the forgiveness that only I can give so that you might be a force of liberation from bondage, from all those bound by debt, most of which, all of which is constructed. I, Jesus says, I offer you forgiveness. I offer you mercy. And when you take that into yourself and recognize the fullness of that, you can, with me, create a new reality. Amen.